Mina damer och herrar, varmt välkomna till kvällens Pi-symposium om medvetandets mysterium och framtiden med artificiell intelligens. Jag heter Christer Sturmark, jag är förlagschef på vetenskapsförlaget Fri Tanke. En del av er känner jag faktiskt igen gick igenom publiken från vår förra vetenskapskväll här den 19 oktober. Hur många av er var här då? Rätt många, ja men vad roligt. Vi gör inte det här var tredje vecka vill jag säga, utan det råkade bli så den här gången. <laughs> det här PIS-symposiet arrangerar Fri Tanke tillsammans med Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin. Som ju för övrigt också har en stor vetenskapsfest snart i Stockholm. Närmare bestämt den 10 december, Nobelbanketten som ni vet. Det är ju lite så, när mörkret faller över Sverige då tände vi upplysningens ljus, som ni ser här. Svävande glödlampor, leviterande glödlampor. Och jag kan lova er, det är inte magi, även om det ser ut så. Ehm, upplysningens ljus, det här kommer bli en kväll i vetenskapen och filosofins frontlinjer, vill jag påstå. Vid min sida ikväll har jag Vetenskapsakademins vice preses Hans Ellegren. Välkommen upp. Jag som sagt, hjärtligt välkomna till denna mycket spännande kväll. Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin delar ju tillsammans med förlaget Fri Tanke ut Pi-priset, ett av Sveriges största litterära priser. Priset är för främjande av populärvetenskaplig litteratur, huvudsakligen inriktat på naturvetenskap. Mellan prisutdelningarna, så, som många av er vet, och vi hörde att många var här nyligen, så anordnas olika föreläsningar och pi-symposier. Och ikväll har vi just ett sånt pi-symposium. För Kungliga Vetenskapsakademin är det här ett oerhört viktigt arrangemang. Vi ser det här som en av våra viktigaste uppgifter helt enkelt. Och det är faktiskt så att i Vetenskapsakademins grundregler så står det i portalparagrafen, den allra första paragrafen, så står det att vår uppgift är att sprida kunskap och rön och, och, och ny kunskap om problem i samhället om aktuell forskning. Och det här är ett av de sätt som vi gör det på. I kväll ska vi få höra två mycket framstående forskare. Daniel Dennett, som är professor i filosofi och är föreståndare för The Center of Cognitive Studies vid Tuft University. Daniel Dennett, han är författare till flera böcker om medvetandes evolution. Och han menar att vetenskapen nu faktiskt har en bra teori om vad medvetandet egentligen är. Nick Bostrom är professor i filosofi vid universitetet i Oxford. Och där är han också ledare av The Future of Humanity Institute. Boströms idéer om artificiell superintelligens de har väckt stor uppmärksamhet runt om i världen. Idag möter han Daniel Dennett för första gången. Och det ska ske här på scenen om en liten stund. Oerhört spännande samtal att se fram emot. Ja, jag hoppas att ni lika mycket som jag ser fram emot att få lyssna på det här ikväll. Och återigen hjärtligt välkomna. Precis. Precis. Både Daniel Dennett och Nick Boström har ju nyligen kommit ut med varsin bok på svenska. Passa på att köpa dem i pausen och få dem signerade efter föreställningen här inne. Men först... Vad vore dessa vetenskapskvällar utan musik? Idag gästas vi av artisten José González med Göteborg som hemmabas men världen som turnéplan. Bortsett från att vara en eminent artist så är José också djupt engagerad i vetenskap, filosofi och de filosofiska existentiella grundfrågorna. En sann upplysningsmänniska. Därför tycker vi det är väldigt spännande att José är med oss ikväll och bjuder på sin musik. Så vi inleder kvällen med musik den här gången. Mina damer och herrar, José González.
idle as it seemed Trudging through the mist Following the creeds Erasing dim lines on a list Eager to arrive Leaving footprints in the clay Reading rocks and lines Telling in the coffin gray Telling in the coffin gray Scattered rays of light And dust grains in the air Or berries in the tree Burn a steady flare Among the members of the sea Some of their frail and incomplete In a past filled with pains She runs From the deepest valley passes on Opening up the vault To find spinning tops and plates Bedded, nested yarn Diverting from the gates But once a faint elusive moss Is that the rain of the morning In that all deserted yards Come to life Surface from the dark to realize when a past fell, she runs from the deepest valley past the sun. Idle as a wave Moving out at sea Cruising without sound Molding what's to be Serene between the trails Serene with the time Thanks, Mickey. Väldigt kul att vara här och jättespännande att få höra de här två stora tänkarna samtala om mina favoämnen. Så att jag är bara glad att vara här. Så att jag kör några låtar till så fort jag kan. 
låten heter Stories We Build, Stories We Tell. Wondering what's on your mind. Wondering what's driving you. Thank you.
Thanks, Ash Mickey. Hi, I'm Finkel. Thanks, Jan. Good to see you, Wow. Think I'm going to play like that, there, also. I have also a classic guitar at home and long nails on the right arm, but not fast. I can't play like that. Ah, I'm getting over it. Nice. Our our understanding of the brain's anatomy and function has never been varit bättre än nu. Det sägs ibland att 90 procent av det vi vet om hjärnan har vi lärt oss de senaste 20 åren. Jag vet inte om det stämmer, men det är ändå ett uttryck för att forskningen har gått framåt oerhört snabbt. Ändå är det ju så att frågan om hur vårt medvetande har uppstått, hur vår förmåga till självreflektion har evolverat, är fortfarande i mångt och mycket en kontroversiell fråga och höljt i något slags dunkel. Ja, det beror på vem man frågar i och för sig. Men en av världens absolut främsta auktoriteter på just det här är här ikväll. It is my great honor to be able to present to you the mastermind of the mind. A professor of philosophy and a prophet of evolutionary consciousness. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Daniel Dennett. Thank you. Now. Do you want me to talk first? No. Right. Um, your brain, by latest count, consists of 
about 86 billion neurons. Each one of them is a semi-autonomous little living cell, direct descendants of things not unlike bacteria, and not a single one knows who you are or cares. There's no boss, there's no king neuron, and yet, when you put together 86 billion of them in just the right way, you get a conscious human mind. If you look at a termite castle, it might be the product of several million termites working hard and myopically, stupidly, but very competently to build that wonderful structure. But termites, although they can build great architecture and forage and air condition their palaces, they can't write poetry, send a rocket to the moon, do science. There is a sort of termite technology, but there aren't any termite technologists. What's the difference? How do we human beings manage somehow to have minds made up out of our brains? We're living in the age of intelligent design. All around us are the fruits of genius and hard work and technology and education, and whether we're looking at the arts, poetry, music, or at engineering, or at politics, or at philosophy or science, we see a tremendous outpouring at an ever-increasing pace of the fruits of intelligent design. How is it possible that this change has happened in the biosphere in the last few thousand years, actually? the presence of intelligent design of our sort is a very, very recent development. For over three billion years, there was no understanding at all on the plant. Trees don't understand. They do things for reasons, but they don't understand the reasons they don't have to. Termites don't understand the reasons why they do the things they do, but they do some very appropriate one might almost say clever things, but the termites don't know that. Even the dolphins and whales and chimpanzees and your own dog, they're extremely competent at what they do well, but they have very little, if any, understanding. That's one of the main themes of my book. And the slogan is competence without comprehension. The process of natural selection itself is a designer of all of these wonderful life forms, an extraordinarily competent process, but it has no mind, it has no understanding, it has no purpose, it has no foresight. It is a process of breathtaking competence and no comprehension at all. So the question is, how did a process without an intelligent designer manage to generate, create intelligent designers who could then ask, how could a process without an intelligent designer go on to create intelligent designers that could then create the tools the thinking tools they needed to ask and answer that question. Sometimes that looks almost paradoxical or pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, but I don't think it is. It's a difficult question to answer, but that's the one I'm trying to answer. The key element, the difference between the termite colony and your brain is nicely summed up by a friend of mine, who I believe is here, Bo Dalbum, who once said, 
You can't do much carpentry with your bare hands, and you can't do much thinking with your bare brain. What you need is tools. And what we have is thinking tools par excellence, not by the hundreds, but by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. Every word in your vocabulary is a thinking tool. There are lots of other thinking tools. There are some thinking tools that are concrete, that have physical realizations, things like, like computers and uh, uh, but, uh, binoculars and microscopes and uh, recording devices and uh, uh, protractors and pencils and paper, blackboards, printing presses. But a lot of them are just abstract tools. They're really just thinking tools. They're ways of doing things that we have that no other creatures do. From the moment you're born, your brain begins to acquire these thinking tools. You don't have to design them themselves yourself. They're already beautifully designed. You just help yourself to them. Who designed them? Nobody. They were designed by another evolutionary process. Natural selection, but not of genes this time, but of thinking tools, of means. Ways of doing things. There are two ways of doing things that matter in biology. One are instincts. Those are ways that are passed along genetically through, through the egg and the sperm. The other kind of ways are passed along perceptually, socially. You learn them by seeing them or hearing them, watching people do them, being taught them in some cases and just picking them up as you go in many other cases. Now these ways are beautifully designed to do the jobs they do. Words are very well designed. Arithmetic is fantastically well designed. Nobody designed it. Nobody designed it. It simply fell into place as a result of a process of natural selection of cultural items of what Dawkins calls means. A way that I like to put it, which is a little shocking, but I think is not even metaphorical, it's, it's just about the literal truth. These thinking tools designed by cultural evolution are apps that you download to your neck top. <laughs> when you get a brand new computer or cell phone and it has no apps on it, it's not very competent. As you pile on the apps, you gain tremendous new competences. And it's the same way. Now, what does this have to do with consciousness? Well, one of the most brilliant features of modern technology, like your cell phone or your mobile phone, is the user interface, that wonderful user illusion on the screen, where you get a very simplified, metaphorical rendition of what's going on in the hardware. You don't want to know what's going on inside. It's too complicated. So the clever engineers have brilliantly designed a user interface which simplifies everything for you so you can be an adept user. It's, as we say, user-friendly. Well, it turns out that your brain could use some user-friendly inventions as well. And it has them. Your brain, the parts of your brain that have to learn from each other, that have to communicate, that have to send information back and forth, they don't just, they're not just born, as it were, able to talk to each other, able to communicate. This is, this is a hard-won victory. You have to design those paths of communication. So there are user interfaces of one part of the brain to the other parts of the brain. But there's no little screen in there, and there's no little eyeball in there. It's all done just in the medium of spike trains in neurons. It's dark in there. There's no inner theater, but it seems as if there is. That's the illusion of consciousness. I'm not saying that consciousness doesn't exist. I'm just saying it isn't what you think it is. 
It is illusory in some regards because it seems, probably to many of you, if not all of you, that there's a sort of wonderful, magical show going on between your ears somewhere, somewhere in your head. No, there isn't. If you think that, you're just plain wrong. But it seems as if that's going on, and that's the illusion. I think we're making great progress in explaining that illusion and explaining how the kind of consciousness that depends on that illusion enhances our powers, gives us the power, among other things, to be responsible moral agents. It gives us the power to reflect on our own future and on the anticipatable effects of our actions looking way into the future. And that capacity, which we alone have, is what, on the one hand, may permit us to save our planet from disaster, or, on the other hand, may help us find a way to hasten the demise of life on this planet. We wield tremendous power. Fortunately, we're smart enough to take responsibility for that power, thanks to all the thinking tools that have evolved in our brain. I think that's probably a good place to stop. Daniel Dennett. <laughs> Please sit down, Dan. Um, Senare ikväll efter pausen så ska vi tränga djupare in i ämnet artificiell intelligens. Men nu ska vi främst uppehålla oss just vid det fascinerande fenomenet consciousness. So to discuss consciousness together with us, I'd like to invite on stage the professor of philosophy and director of the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. Please welcome Nick Boström. So, I just said in Swedish that we will focus on consciousness in this first session and the next session will focus on artificial intelligence, but of course this will mix, obviously. Uh, and I actually like to start with you, Nick, because this is the first time you meet in a conversation, the two of you. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Dan's work and theories, but can you, can you say some spontaneous reaction to, to the theories that Dan represents and what he said right now? What do you think about this attitude to consciousness? I think there is a lot of commonality. I think we share a kind of physicalist stance. Uh, I think we share the idea that philosophy and science are kind of continuous, not remote, distant opposites. Um, I haven't done as much work on consciousness as Dan has, but I lean towards some kind of computationalist theory of the mind, and I think that is broadly uh, in line with what you think as well. Um, so I think from a, from a sort of basic attitude point of view, I, th I think we're kind of coming from similar positions. No, yes. Definitely. Yeah, I, I do think you have a little different views on artificial intelligence, but we'll, artificial intelligence, but we'll come back to that. But, okay, uh, let me ask you first, Dan. Uh, you have been a leading voice in the philosophy of mind for almost five decades now. If you look back on your, on your work in the, for, for 50 years, what, have you ever changed your mind <laughs> fundamentally about something? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Um, there's a passage in my first book where I am talking about the idea of there being a language of communication in the brain. And I say this, this, this looks like no progress. It looks like replacing the little man in the brain with a committee, which, didn't, which was a joke. And it, it dismissed an idea which I later realized, no, 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 that's a good idea. If you can replace the little man in a brain with a committee of agencies that are, they're not conscious, but they have a lot of competence. And then they can communicate among themselves. And if they're 
too smart to model right now. Well, look inside. They're composed of even smaller and stupider homunculi. And eventually you get down to homunculi that are, uh, you can replace them with a machine. You can put a robot in there and they'll do all the work. So this is sometimes called homuncular functionalism. The idea that a whole person is usefully decomposable into a whole lot of hemi, semi, demi, proto persons that are not themselves conscious, but that are cognitively capable. They, they are responsible for discriminating, keeping track of colors, uh, keeping track of memory, and so forth. Um, and this is progress, because it's not an infinite regress. It's a finite regress, because eventually you, you get down to where you, you can understand that this is just machinery. So as I like to say, uh, when people ask me if there's conscious robots, or could there be, I say, well, yes, of course, there's we're conscious robots. We're robots made of robots, made of robots, made of robots, made of robots. Now, in the old days, not so many years ago, I thought that by the time you got down to a neuron, you could pretty well replace that with a machine. I had in mind something like the McCulloch Pitts logical neuron, if, uh, for people who are aficionados of that literature. That's way too simple. Every individual neuron is actually quite individualistic and much more complicated than a McCulloch Pitts neuron. And so, if you really want to replace the robot, the, the, the agents with the machine, you have to go into the inside of a neuron and start looking at the motor proteins and the other wonderful uh, robotic proteins. Those really are robots, no mm -hmm. question. Nick, do you think that if you one day will create consciousness in, an, in a computer, will it, be mo will it be constructed the same way as Dan's theory of, of, of consciousness? Or could there be different ways of achieving consciousness, different models for that? Or is it that way you do it? So I, I think we're a, a little vague on exactly what consciousness is. Uh, so for that reason, uh, as well as because we are not sure which technological pathways advances in machine intelligence will take, it's difficult to answer that question. Now, I think if we take the relatively easier case first, if you had an exact replica of a particular human brain, a whole brain emulation, say simulated down to the level of synapses, let us say, um, and it then behaved the same, sounded the same, could do the same things as a particular human, then I think that whole brain emulation would very likely be conscious, in, in fact have the same experiences as that the emulated human would have. Um, as, as you move away from that to artificial minds that are composed very differently, have different sets of attributes, uh, it, it gets harder. Um, and I think that's when you begin to put stress on the impression we have that we really understand what consciousness is. Um, when you conceive of minds that maybe have very high levels of capabilities in certain directions and yet are completely incompetent in other directions, um, in ways that separate these capability bundles that come naturally uh, as units when, when we're talking about human minds or even animal minds, then, then it, it becomes a lot less obvious whether one would want to ascribe consciousness to such things. But you said we're not, maybe we're not even sure what consciousness is. Maybe we should ba start that on that very <laughs> basic level. I'm thinking of Derek Parfit's teleportation thought experiment where he says that uh, imagine you have a machine that could scan your body atom by atom and uh, put it together to take other atoms, obviously, on another place, but you put it together atom by atom exactly as your body are configured. Do you both agree that that would be you, actually, on that place? Yes. I, it, would be, it would be me. The, the standard first line of objection to that is, well, what if the scan was not destructive? Exactly. What, what if the, the, uh, the original you and the, and the uh, t teleported you uh, were both in existence at the same yeah. time? Um, my answer to that is, uh, I think, surprising to many people, but 
I think it brings out an important point. So let's imagine that you step into the teleporter mm. and they push the button and miracle of science, but it's all science, the, the atom for atom duplicate of you is created in the booth right next door. Yeah. Um, there's a, then a power failure, the door is open, you're in the dark, you stumble around in the dark, you bump into your doppelganger. So the two of you are wandering around in the dark, the lights come on. <laughs> and the question is, which was the original and which is the copy? <laughs> not only do the people in the control room not know, but you don't know. You don't know. There would be no, no way you could know. And so which one is the real you? The question at this point doesn't have an answer. There's just no fact of the matter. Nick, do you agree that it's you that is teleported to Mars? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. So there are two different questions here. We started with consciousness. So I think even some of the philosophers who think it wouldn't be you might think that would be a conscious person on Mars. And if there was a power failure, also a conscious person back here. Uh, now, the question of personal identity then comes on top of that, whether... Yeah, because you start to diversify. The original. Yeah, and so uh, I, I think moment. that at least in the case where there is no power failure, I would be tempted to say that the thing emerging from Mars would be me, so that you could okay. survive a teletransportation device. Okay, but if the operator... You go into this teleportation station at, on Earth, and you, you want to go to Mars, and then the operator opens the door and says, sorry, we, we forgot to destroy you here on the Earth. You are on Mars now, so if you excuse me, I have to kill you now. Would you say, no problem? No. <laughs> no. No. Uh, yeah. Okay. But, but, no, that's... But I don't view this as a, as a difficulty. This is, as, as one says, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug of the theory. Uh, uh, the very idea that there is a metaphysically unique self, a sort of indestructible atom of meanness, that's just a bad idea. Descartes it's a very see, tempting idea. Yeah, the but, dualistic view of soul well, and body. You, you know, it's, and, and Derek Parfit was one who explored this with great sensitivity and imagination mm -hmm. over the years. Um, there's an obvious sense in which I'm the same Dan Dennett who was little Danny Dennett living in Winchester, Massachusetts and being a Cub Scout back in the, you know, early 50s. But, but it's only in virtue of the, the, the continuity that has been maintained over that time that so much has changed. It's... It's just like the old ship of Theseus all over again, you know. The, uh, the, the ship goes off and all the parts get replaced and it comes back and that's fine. It's still the ship of Theseus. And then somebody says, well, actually, as you threw out the old parts, we gathered them all up and we've put them all back together. Now, which is the ship of Theseus? The, uh, the one which is all made of replacement parts or the one that these were all the original parts? These are interesting philosophical puzzles. And the important thing, though, to realize about them is that the conviction we have that there's got to be an answer is just, no, there doesn't have to be an answer. It does, there doesn't have to be a fact of the matter in such cases. So I think that's right. What it seems that there has to be an answer to that is what you would choose on reflection. So some of these seemingly metaphysical questions are connected to questions of value. So mm -hmm. the concept of personal identity, one reason why we're interested in it is that a lot of people don't want to die. Um, and similarly with consciousness, if there is a box that's not conscious, you think there is no problem in doing whatever to it, the sledgehammer or whatever, but if it's consciousness, if it's conscious, then there are certain things that you think would be morally wrong, like if it causes the thing pain and so forth. Um, and if you are in a situation where you make a choice that turns out one way or another, um, as to these, these factors, then uh, in a sense you feel that you want to make the choice depending on the answer to one of these questions. Well, well, but, but that may be the mistake right there. You have to make a choice, but if you think that, that the right choice depends on one of those being the, being the which one is the real you. 
Now, so, let me let me just yeah. suggest that <laughs> suppose there is a real you and a non-real you. That non-real you loves all the same things, is loved by all the same people, has all the same projects, remembers all the same songs. Um, why isn't the, the future of that you just as important, if it's important oh, well, to you? So, uh, from a moral point of view, it might be equally important. Exactly. But from a prudential point of view, a lot of people care more about themselves than about other people. Well, they, but I, if we want to focus I would on say this... No, you're caring about yourself in either case. Well, I mean, so take the, 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 the moral case with, a, say, yeah. whether a particular box is conscious or not. Um, so, so there, it, it, it seems that a morally motivated person will want to make a choice that depends on whether the box really is conscious or not. Sure. Um, and so it's almost as if our... The, it's almost as if the ontology of our values uh, is based on some of these concepts like personal identity, uh, consciousness, that when you come at them from another point of view, seem deeply problematic and, and maybe you would rather see it's a matter of degree or perspective, but um, if we then have these values that are kind of formulated in one vocabulary and then we think that vocabulary is fundamentally confused, there is the question of what do you then translate your values to if, if, if you're no longer allowed to use that original conceptual foundation for them? Yes, I understand that, but I don't think... I think that philosophers tend to put too much weight on tradition here and think that there's obviously got to be a right answer about this, even about the issue of consciousness. Thus, uh, there might be the... So, suppose this is a thought experiment of my own where I have a computer duplicate or a functional duplicate made of my brain and uh, uh, I have a little switch. I can turn it back and forth. I'm either under the control of a brain in a vat or under the control of this giant computer model of that brain, and they're, they're in perfect sync, but otherwise not communicating with each other. It doesn't matter to me which, which brain I use uh, as long as they're in sync. And as soon as they're out of sync, then there's two people. And, you know, they, they both matter. So, so, I mean, I think in that case, if you, you can hold the theory of consciousness, which makes that come out. True. Yeah. And, and in fact, if, if that just happens to be the correct one, then it's not as if there is a question that doesn't have an answer. It's that it has an answer. And in fact, these two are sort of redundant instantiations of the same mind or whatever. So I'm, I'm more... Uh, I, I feel there is like a remaining problem in the cases where the attitude is that the question is somehow fake. Um, where at the same time, it looks like important values hinges on the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. that, then I think we are in a more fundamental predicament. And I, I think personal identity and consciousness are, are both concepts that, from pure, if, if, if the goal is purely to have an accurate, descriptive, predictive model of the world, these seem kind of confusing things to bring into the picture. Um, but if, if if, if the goal is to have a worldview that connects to our values and goals, then it seems more difficult to dispense with those concepts. Let me go back to the, the question you asked, what is consciousness? I'd like to formulate it this way. How should we ever be able to tell if there is consciousness present in a computer or in a human being, if, if you wish? How can you different, differentiate between competence and comprehension. How, how can you know if it's just a zombie acting or if there is a self-awareness? How do you know? Well, I think the, the, philosoph the philosopher's zombie is, a, is a, a concept that would be well advised, we'd be well advised to abandon. I think it is, a, it does no interesting work, intellectual work, and the idea, a philosophical zombie, a philosopher's zombie, is exactly as adroit and as, as, as good company, we might say, as a conscious person yeah. who's just nobody home. Maybe you should explain to the audience that we're not talking about the zombies. We're not talking about the dead. walking dead. No. <laughs> we're talking about the philosophical yeah. thought yeah. experiment yeah. of a zombie. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you should explain and, that. And what is that? Well, these words stick in my throat because I think I'm now 
explaining a concept that philosophers have invented, which I wish they hadn't. I think it's okay, nonsense, okay. Okay. but I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but fair enough. But, but okay, I, I can do it then. It's, 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 a, it's a someone acting just like everyone else, but has no yep. consciousness, yep. right? Yep. And uh, my question still it's is... A, it's a bit like the con concept of a zomcat. A, a zomcat. Okay. I just made it up. A zomcat... <laughs> Is atom for atom identical with a cat, uh -huh. but it's not alive. Uh -huh, okay. It eats, it sleeps, it does everything else. It's yeah. not alive. Okay, but how do you dif how do you see the difference? How should well, there we isn't any difference. <laughs> okay, but then we can never know if an artificial intelligence no. develops consciousness well, or not. No, we have a computer no. that acts very the, the, well the, in the world, but how do we know if it consciousness emerges? Your very question supposes that consciousness is this extra glow or light or some magical property. No, it's not. Okay. It's, it's the very system of cognitive organization that okay. guides and modulates all that wonderful behavior, that, that decides which songs to sing and who to marry and all the rest of it. That's what consciousness is. The idea that you could have an agent that had all that adroitness, all that uh, ability to get around in the world and speak three languages and do X, Y, and Z, and it wasn't conscious, you're just contradicting yourself without realizing it. It's like that cat which <laughs> procreates, eats, sleeps, catches mice and birds, but it isn't alive. How do you know? I don't know, God told me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but Nick, the, 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 this means that your AI projects that you, I guess, you're working on could already now be conscious, according to that. No, no, well, no, no, because it doesn't have the competences. <laughs> so, so uh, one thing that I was going to ask you about, kind of out of curiosity, not, not as a sort of setup, but um, is your view about, say, animals and insects, yeah. where, where um, consciousness starts. Oh, I uh, think that the very idea that consciousness is either there or not is itself a big mistake. Consciousness comes in degrees. And it comes in all sorts of different degrees and varieties. And uh, the idea that there is one property which divides the universe into those things that are conscious and those that aren't is itself a really preposterous mistake. So let me, um, because I, I agree that consciousness comes in degrees. Um, so if we reformulate the question, uh, at what point in the phylogenetic ladder um, is there some degree of consciousness that gives us moral reasons to treat the thing one way or another for its own sake? Yeah. That question which is behind a great deal of the, of the theorizing and the phony theorizing about consciousness, the question about where, where, do the, where do the moral obligations come in, is a serious moral question. It's a serious political question. And the idea that science is going to show you where to draw the line is just not on the cards. There is not going to be in that spectrum of cases, a pure scientific answer. What there are going to be is a lot of scientific evidence that shows that, for instance, some organisms have a, are very sensitive to the conditions in which they are existing in a ways that others aren't. I mean, th they are perturbed and, yeah. and disrupted and, you might say, bothered. Now, is that real bothering? Is it conscious bothering? That's the wrong question. The question is, how much disruption is there? And, and, and where do we want to draw the line? And I think a very big part of the question of where we draw the line has to do with our sense not of those creatures that are the, the, the potential sufferers, but our sense of us as fellow creatures and how we feel about that. I think a great deal of the, of the political moral issue that we have to decide has to do with um, our own comfort with the decision we make 
which is independent of, of the underlying facts. There are people, after all, who are extremely uncomfortable if you, um, if you spit on the flag. Well, this is just a piece of cloth. <laughs> but it means something important, and they're not wrong to see that it means something important. And they'd really rather you didn't spit on the flag, and they have some pretty good reasons for it. The flag is unconscious, it's not suffering, but, and similarly, people could feel about, let us say, um, taking a magnifying glass in the sunlight and burning ants as they come out of their anthill with the focused beam. A lot of little boys do it. And I think, I'd, I'd rather they didn't. I don't want them to do that. I think it, it coarsens their view of life and our view of life. I don't think it can be the, the prohibition or the discouragement of such acts hinges on the discovery of something in those ants which is, the, as it were, the locus of suffering that we found it at last and here it is and ants do suffer. I think that's a will of the wisp. We're not going to find things like that. And we don't have to. So, I, mean, so I, I agree that it's not likely science will deliver onto us on a plate the answers to those kinds of questions. But uh, a, a, a philosophy of consciousness, one would hope, would have some, something to help us maybe make those kinds of choices. It seems that in terms of how we treat, say, an animal or may maybe a person in, in with brain damage who has certain yeah. attributes yeah. of a normal mind and lacks others, uh, is, is, is partly a moral question, um, but partly also perhaps a, a question of what's there in terms of their functionality and subjective experiences. Exactly, um, yeah, that is. And, and it, it certainly feels for some of these dilemmas that um, Yes, maybe we want to know what we would feel, but it also seems at the same time that what we would feel depends on our beliefs about whether or not it, it does have this uh, capacity to experience uh, phenomenal pain. Well, if, if, if it is, as I suggest, in the end a political question, then we have to acknowledge that there may be portions of the popu population, maybe large portions of the population, that have deeply felt hunches, intuitions that they will not abandon and won't even consider abandoning. They think it's, they think it's immoral even to think about abandoning these hunches, which uh, uh, would oblige everybody, uh, let us say, uh, not to spit on a flag. But Dan, let me ask you, I mean, your, your view of, of consciousness is still controversial. I mean, you have, there are other philosophers who argue strongly against you. I mean, Thomas Nagel, for example, he believes that consciousness yes. is some kind of primitive qualia in, the, in matter, in the atoms no. or something. Or, or John Searle, I mean, I will never forget your exchange back in 95, I think, it was in New York Review of Books, you had an exchange with John Searle, which was the closest of a street fight between two philosophers I, I've ever seen. Uh, you really disagree on these things. What, what, how do you handle their critique? What is your answer to them? What, how did they get it wrong? Well, I've, that's a, a tale that takes a little unraveling to spell out, and, and we don't have time. I mean, John Searle is wrong in so many ways. It would take me, <laughs> it would take me hours, okay, hours. Okay, okay, you don't, you don't want to hear. Um, and, and, you know, Nagel, Nagel strongly disagrees and he expresses his disagreement, but you will hunt high and low in that review to find an argument. Mm, yeah, he, he does a very nice job of laying out what my theory is, and then he says, that can't be right. Well, that's his view, it can't be right. But he doesn't give a good reason. He doesn't even try to give a good reason why it can't be right. 
And I read his book, and he doesn't really present any arguments no, for no. his own theory. He just says no. it could be this way, which no. is an, yeah, a bit strange, I think. But anyway, yeah. So, so let me try to answer your previous... Because you asked Please. me earlier whether... How, how do we know that current AI systems are not conscious? Yeah. Um, so I was trying to get some help by first figuring out whether uh, animals are conscious, or insects, or spiders, or mm. something like that. Because if we have to compare current AI systems to anything, maybe a spider or something like that. Um, so now, uh, the answer that I think got is that ultimately there might be no fact of the matter, and uh, all, all we can do is kind of interrogate our own dispositions to feel sympathy and see what, what comes up, and maybe different people will come up with different mm. things. Um, it, it still feels, though, that for these things that we haven't, so most people just haven't thought very much about whether, whether a spider or whether a mouse or exactly where their sympathies would start to kick in, even less have they thought about different artificial agents and what would be required. So it, 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 it seems quite possible that one would have one reaction the first time one thinks of this, but if one spent more time looking at it from different angles, discussing mm -hmm. it, one might be led to a slightly different view about that. So that the, the, the prospect of there being such a process where through the deliberation one would actually come to a different stance suggests that even if there is no fact of the matter that would answer the whole question, there seems to be relevant fact of the matters that maybe one can access through this process of there, deliberation. There are, but some, some of those facts are, are uh, as they emerge, are are uh, disconcerting, let's say. Uh, when I was working with Rod Brooks on the COG project, the humanoid robot at MIT, uh, COG wasn't conscious. COG wasn't close to being conscious. COG, that was the goal at the time, was to make a conscious humanoid robot. But COG had some behaviors that were stunningly lifelike. Um, when somebody walked in the room, COG it would attract Cog's attention, Cog's eyes would track that person across the room. It's quite spooky when that happens. Uh, I remember a time when uh, the television presenter Alan Alda was interviewing Rod Brooks in the lab, and Rod was explaining something about Cog. Co Rod, Cog, uh, Alan Alda, and while Rod was explaining, Cog was just like this, and then Alda interrupted to ask a question, and Cog went like this, and absolutely brought him to a standstill. Um, and uh, Cog's arms were very, they weren't robotic like this, they were very loosey-goosey. One of my uh, uh, TAs came over to the lab one day, and, and, and uh, Matt Williamson, the arm guy, said, just shake hands there. And she shook hands with Cog's arm, which wasn't even on Cog's shoulder at the point. It was C-clamped to the desk, but it was on. And she shook hands with it, and she screamed. She said, it's alive, <laughs> because of the way it responded. So it's easy. What we realized is it's child's play to convince people that robots are conscious when they aren't. But this but, is so, 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 I, th I think that's kind of what I'm getting at is that one wants to describe some of these reactions as sort of misfirings of the sympathetic impulse or something. And that maybe these people, if they learned more about how COG works, would say, wow, actually, that was an illusion. Uh, then there may be this other system that looks like nothing because it's just going on inside a microprocessor, but such that if you really studied it and understood how it works, you would feel much more uh, yeah. drawn to think, after all, this, this does look like there is a lot of I don't know exactly what it is, but some sort of reinforcement learning loop, self-reflection, complex cognitive capacities, delicately mm. interwoven. Maybe that does have some moral standing. And, and it, it, I, I think there is some cognitive work to be done there to figure out w even what our emotional dispositions are after we've had a chance to sort of look at it from different angles. This is really interesting. I think we should talk about that more in the next session. I mean, how, e how easily you can make humans get emotional reactions to robots, even if they're not conscious at all, or, or you know. Yep. But it's, yeah, we, I want to talk more about that in the next session. One last question in this session, uh, small little question, free will. <laughs> yeah. Dan, you, I know that you say that, uh, this consciousness explained that is no 
metaphysical spirit or anything, we still have a free will. Can you just give us two minutes explanation? How can we have a free will if everything is just small robots cooperating in your brain? Because free will, the kind that's worth wanting, is a matter of having, in one simple phrase, moral competence. It's being able to be moved by reasons, to be able to move yourself with reasons, to reflect on your actions that you're contemplating and what their results would be, and to take responsibility for those actions and know what you're doing when you do that. And that has nothing to do with determinism. John McCarthy, the coiner of the term AI, once told me, I'm now writing a, a paper about this because uh, it's been rattling around in my head for years since he told me. He, he asked, or perhaps ordered, his four-year-old daughter to do something. And she looked up at him and she said, I can, but I won't. <laughs> and he said that she, she discovered her free will. I think exactly right. When you say that and know what it means, you know that, first of all, it's up to you. You know what you can do. You also know there's lots of things you can't do. You know, please jump over the table. I can't do that. But you, you have a sense of your abilities, what, what, what is open to you, and you're building your policies, your decisions, on that knowledge of the engineering term, the degrees of freedom that you have. Now, the engineering term degrees of freedom is the one, it, that's the idea of freedom that we want to use here. It has nothing to do with, with, with uh, determinism or indeterminism. So if you have a robot that has so many degrees of freedom in its arm, that's a, that's a nice, clean, determinable fact which has nothing to do with whether or not that, uh, the robot is deterministic or indeterministic. So free will is completely compatible with a completely deterministic Absolutely, universe. Absolutely, yes. Nick, if you ever create artificial intelligence, uh, general intelligence, will that have a free will? It, I, I, I agree with the compatibilist look on this. So in, in, if it has the same capacities that we have, um, I think yes. Okay. I think that, that ends the first session. We will continue talking about this after the break. Nick Bostrom, Daniel Dennett. Thank you.
didn't I see the forest on fire behind the trees? Thanks, man. Låt. Och nästa är en Beatles låt En av de första jag lärde mig Som är en av Daniels favoriter mm. Blackbird singing in the dead of night Take the spark of winds and learn to fly Blackbird, 
bit to the light of a dark black night. José, fantastiskt att ha dig här ikväll verkligen. Du har turnerat i rätt mycket runt i världen i år, eller hur? Var har du varit? Ja, just i år blev lite mindre än vanligt, men, men annars absolut många... Men vad var det, alltså vi som hörde ditt sommarprogram förra året fick ju ganska klart för oss att du har dina rötter i vetenskapen. Berätta lite grann om din bakgrund där. Ja, min familj är lite av en akademisk wannabe-familj. <laughs> Så det är ingen som... Pappa doktorerar i psykologi, pedagogik. Mamma läste biokemi i Argentina, fick läsa, i, liksom, läsa upp sig igen när hon kom till Sverige. Höll på med virologi. Min bror gillar filosofi, analytisk filosofi. Min syster, antropologi. Men du? Men jag <laughs> höll på med molekylärbiologi. Ja. Och eh, tog min magister, började forska och studera. Men, men släppte allt för att turnera. 14, 14 år sedan. Liksom. Ja, lite, ja det, var, det gick inte så bra med forskningen, <laughs> om jag ska vara ärlig. <laughs> Okej. Okay. Så du tog upp det här istället. Ja, ja det är också ett sätt. Men, men, nej, men seriöst, alltså, ditt sommarprogram, där är du ju väldigt tydlig med att det är inte bara det att du är intresserad av vetenskap. Du tycker verkligen det är viktigt att förmedla en vetenskaplig syn på världen. Och, och du har ju uppenbarligen ganska starkt liksom, etiskt engagemang i vetenskapen också. Var kommer det ifrån? Um, ja, men dels när jag var tonåring och mina vänner var inne på hardcore-musik. Och det var det många som var inne på Straight Edge, som har drogfritt eh, vad ska man säga? Drogfri livsstil. Men det var mycket djurets eh, tankar också. Och då tog jag till mig och läste Peter Singer och hans Animal Liberation. Och sen dess har jag blivit inspirerad av de här tankarna kring medvetande. Och de är intressanta i sig, men att de sen har faktiskt effekt på, på oss kännande individer och andra. Mm. Men sen så tog det fart igen runt tio år sedan när jag skulle skriva min andra skiva och försökte hitta något tema. Och då, då skrev jag skivan In Our Nature som var inspirerad av bland annat Dennett men också Steven Pinker och andra mycket kring evolution och sånt där. Har du berättat för Dan att han inspirerade dig till att göra en platta? Nej, men jag... Det måste du göra. Vi ska ju... Innan kvällen ja, precis. Kvällen är lång. Men du, vad, vad är dina tankar och kanske framförallt känslor inför fenomenet artificiell intelligens? Är det något som oroar dig eller som du tycker är liksom häftigt och spännande? Eller både och kanske? Ja, nej, men jag tycker det känns uh, intressant. Det är väldigt futuristiskt så att jag har oroat mig kring pandemier och lite andra grejer. Lite mer jordnära? Så. Ja, och så tyckte jag att det lät... Uh, ja, nej. Jag, jag tog inte åt mig, men sen dess har jag lyssnat på... Jag läst Nick och eh, lyssnat på Sam Harris och följer edge.org där mm. de, det finns ganska långa samtal och även långa och där de pratar om just eh, långtidstänk. Och i långa loppet så är det inte helt självklart att det, det är liksom, eh, något vi kan kontrollera eller något som ligger i linje med människors eh, liksom, eh, vad ska man säga, eh, bästa... Tror du att vi någonsin kommer kunna ladda upp vårt medvetande till en dator och bli odödliga? 
Ja, men om det är det vi kommer syssla, om det om det är det vi kommer bry oss om så att säga när, när den tekniken finns. Mm. Så att, ja, jag tror att varje individ är ju in, intressant i sig och eh, apropå det chip of Theseus så, mm. så, så blir det lidandet av varje individ som blir intressant. Mm. Sen om, om någon vill leva för evigt men ge bort lite av sitt gamla jag. Det, ja, det är intressant men undrar om det är det vi kommer syssla med. Du är engagerad i den här effektiv altruismrörelsen som ju också har ett bokbord här ute. Säg någonting om bara det avslutningsvis. Ja, så jag, jag valde den enkla vägen att bara ge bort en viss procent, typ 10-20 procent till de mest effektiva välgörenheterna. Men det är bara en liten del av EA-tankegångarna. Så att eh, Nick representerar de som bryr sig om existentiella hot. Och eh, där är jag bara en lyssnare kan man säga. Mm. Ni kan läsa, eller få mer information om det där ute i ditt bokbord. Tack så mycket för att du är här ikväll. Tack. Nu byter vi perspektiv lite grann, som jag sa tidigare, och kommer att fokusera mer på AI-sidan av um, den här vetenskaps- och filosofikvällen. Så so please welcome back on stage Nick Boström. I'll say a few words about um, AI and how I've come to this, this subject. So I run this research uh, institute, uh, which is called the Future of Humanity Institute, which is a sort of grandiose name, um, but somewhat appropriate. So we, we are about 20 people, mathematicians, computer scientists, philosophers, engineers, and, and we have this unusual mandate of trying to think carefully about the really big picture questions for humanity. Um, what are the long-term prospects for Earth originating intelligent life? Are there risks to our very survival? How will maybe technologies be used to transform the world or, or even human nature? And when looking at over all these different things that will change, um, there really is only a, a relatively small set of um, technological changes that could so fundamentally alter the, uh, the human condition um, as to sort of register at, at this macro level. And AI is perhaps the most plausible such uh, drastic change maker, in my opinion. Um, so if you think about it, um, the reason why we humans occupy this unique position on, on our planet today is not because we have bigger muscles than other animals or sharper teeth, it's our brains. Uh, were slightly different from those of our great ape ancestors. Um, there's a little bit of a scaling up, so they're a little bit bigger than those of a chimpanzee, some small rewirings. Um, and through those small changes, you obtain the ability to have language and to accumulate culture, and then after some number of generations, we now have industrial revolution and modern technological society. Um, And the fate of the gorillas now depend a lot more on what we humans do than on what the gorillas do themselves. So it seems prima facie plausible that if we one day succeed at developing machine minds that surpass human minds in, in the same way, or maybe even more than, than we surpass those of other animals, then that could have a fundamentally transformative impact Um, including very bad outcomes, uh, and if you think of what we are doing to certain species, that's not such a bright picture, or, or, or a very good outcome, but at any rate, a very fundamental change. And in fact, the discovery of greater than human machine intelligence would be the last invention that we ever need to make, in as much as if they really have full general intelligence, then amongst the other things that that intelligence could be used for is further inventing, uh, further scientific discovery. So. The creation of human-level AI or, or superintelligence would not just be one more cool technology like next year's iPhone, but it would, I think, mean a kind of telescoping of the future. So, so think of all those possible technologies that, that maybe the human species could have attained if we had 40,000 years to work on it. it you know, maybe we would have a cure for aging and space colonies and perfectly realistic virtual realities and uploading and all of these things that 
or sort of completely science fiction technologies right now, but we know that they are consistent with the basic laws of physics. So all of those things that we could get that in the fullness of time, if you had the technological development done by machine at digital timescales, could happen quite quickly. So I think you get this sort of rush to technological maturity, if and when you get super intelligent machine intelligence. So, so it seemed like a really big thing. And there were a lot of people um, working on trying to make this happen. From, from the very outset of AI, the, the goal has all along been to produce full general uh, intelligence, not just to automate specific tasks. Um, but although there were hundreds and even thousands of people working towards this goal, there was very little thought about what would happen if we were to succeed. Um, so that, that seems kind of strange. And so to me, it seemed kind of obvious that if we were to succeed at reaching full human level general intelligence, uh, we wouldn't stop there. That would be an obvious next step, which would be full super intelligence, something radically smarter than we are. And I, in fact, argue in my book that that next step would probably happen fairly soon after human level AI is attained. So it might take a long time to get to human level AI, but after you get there, then super intelligence might follow shortly thereafter, maybe hours, you know, maybe months, maybe a few years, I, I very much doubt decades. Um, so you would have this intelligence explosion, the entering into the world of the last inventions human will ever need to make, something far smarter than us, including at strategizing and inventing new technologies, and a lot of people working to make this happen, and very little thought about what would happen if that succeeded. So, so that, that's what kind of caused me to uh, embark on this, this book project, and um, I was trying to understand what are the dynamics that you get when this kind of intelligence explosion starts to seem imminent and then when it happens. And in particular, what could go wrong? Because it seemed to me that um, it would be useful to have a more detailed understanding of exactly where the pitfalls are so that we could try to make sure to steer clear of them. Whereas we might get by with a fairly vague general sense of all the wonderful things we could use the technology for if we managed. Um, to develop it safely. And so, because I, I want to be brief, let me just pick out one major source of concern, which is what is now known as the control problem, or sometimes the alignment problem, um, which is basically the, uh, the, the question of, if, if you could one day figure out how to create some machine superintelligence, how could you ensure that it will be safe, that it will do what you intend for it to do? so that you not bring into the world some really powerful, antagonistic, super-intelligent optimization process that is trying to convert um, the planet into something different from what we would want it to be used for. Because that seems like a, a, a losing uh, scenario for, for humanity if we are kind of battling against something that is vastly smarter than us. So ultimately, this is a technical challenge, and, and there is now, and in fact, since, since the book came out, a, a research field springing up to address precisely that with groups in various places, uh, at Berkeley, in Montreal, Google. We are running joint technical seminars with DeepMind in London, and so, so there is now work trying to figure out scalable control methods that, that could be used uh, in, in, in this contingency that we actually solve the AI problem. Um, and I think there needs to be more work of that sort, but uh, at least it's a start. So my view on timescales is that we don't really know uh, as to how far away we are from human-level AI. Uh, and, and in fact, even the concept of human-level AI, once you start to look at it, is kind of uh, uh, maybe not exactly right. Um, we did a poll of some of the world's leading machine learning experts um, and asked a number of questions, one of which was, by which year do you think there is a 50% probability that full human-level uh, general AI has been attained? And the median answer to that question was 2040 or 2045, uh, depending on precisely which group of experts we asked. Um, which is interesting, because that's, I think, in the lifetime of a lot of people in, in this room, probably. So that's the 50% mark. Uh, it could happen a lot sooner or a lot later. Now, if you look at individual AI expert opinions, they are literally all over the map. So there are some people who are 100% convinced that it will happen in the next 10 or 15 years, and there are other people who are absolutely convinced that it can never happen, and anything in between. And I, I think we really don't have that much more um, precision 
on, on that type of question. And we just need to acknowledge our uncertainty about the timescales. But what we don't want to do is to be caught, w w whether it happens 10 years from now or 40 years or 80 years from now, uh, sort of caught off guard saying, that, oh, now we figured out how to build super intelligence, but we have no idea how to control it. Because I, 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 think, I think humanity doesn't really have the ability to stop at, at that point. Like, it's going to be a lot of research groups competing to get there first, and as soon as it can be done, it will be done. So we better have figured out these kinds of control techniques before so that they are ready to be implemented. And uh, we might have to get it right on the first try. So, um, so, so, so that's, 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 that's kind of the, the, the brief synopsis of the book, and I maybe uh, can, can kind of elaborate more during the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we would like Daniel Dennett to come on stage as well um, to continue discussing AI. Yes, there you are. Great. Please come in, Dan. So, uh, first of all, uh, let, I, let me do the reverse thing as I did before. Dan, what do you say about this? I know you're more skeptical than Nick to AI. Tell us about that. Well, a lot of people know about Marvin Minsky and the, the Summer Vision Project. In the early days of AI, he and his students thought they'd do vision over a summer. It's 50 years later, and vision is still not very well done. Uh, the uh, degree of enthusiasm and optimism in AI, uh, not to say hype, in many instances, has there been wave after wave of it. So one starts with, with a certain uh, skepticism born of past experience and thinks that this is... This is Yet another wave of hype, and it will, it will soon die down. But I think I, I, uh, I agree with Nick that we don't want to make a mistake on this. No. And <laughs> if it's going to happen, we want to be prepared. Nick, do you agree that there, the, the history of AI has been a history of great expectations and crushed illusions. I remember when I studied computer science in the late nine, uh, 80s, uh, it was expert systems, it was the big thing, and then it sort of yeah. really didn't turn no, out. I, I think we can sometimes the birth of AI is, is, is dated to like 56, that was yeah. the term was introduced. So we've had sort of 60, 61 years, which is a significant amount of time, but it's not that long, I mean, um, and I think there have been maybe two waves of hype during this time. So the early pioneers were underestimating the difficulty um, and they were taught expert system kind of things. And then, and then there was a kind of wave of neural network uh, enthusiasm. Um, so both of those waves of enthusiasm were followed by AI winters where, where it became almost like a dirty word. You didn't want to call your startup an AI company because that meant you were one of these high parties. But, but now, now we're kind of in the third great wave of excitement. And I'd actually say that with vision, I, I think maybe it's being provocative, but I can say that maybe it, it has been solved about seven years ago with this recent deep learning uh, revolution. We now have AI systems that can look at the picture and make a reasonably informed uh, guess about what's in it um, that can recognize faces my iPhone 10 dog. can recognize my face. Sorry? Very, my iPhone 10 can recognize right. my face this, when this, I log this in this very accurately. This didn't used to be possible. So one big thing that has changed um, is the uh, sh focus has shifted to machine learning. Mm. Um, so that in the olden days, vision researchers tried to handcraft these features, like tried to write down rules. as if, if you see two lines intersecting at this angle, maybe that's the corner of an eye, and then put together... So that, that, that didn't really work. But then, more recently, what has worked are these deep neural networks where you basically have an architecture that um, can be trained um, with stochastic gradient descent. And, and by presenting many uh, instances of the correct classification, you can tweak the weights of this neural network, and it learns to generalize in a very neat way. And, and the focus is on crafting these learning algorithms. 
and to some extent the architectures, but they don't need to be sort of tailor-made for each application. But your point is also, uh, as I understand it, that there, there might come a time where the, where the software evolves sort of uncontrollable for us humans. It starts to evolve itself in a ways that we cannot control. Is that well, right? Well, evolve right? is one of these words that mean kind of, to some people it means just change. So yes, it could change. Um, but it also has a more uh, narrow meaning, like evolutionary process, the generation, random generation of different alternatives, and then iterated selection on that. So I don't... Using evolutionary algorithms is one technique in AI, and maybe that, maybe that will turn out to be useful. Uh, but there are also other ways of engineering these systems that, that rely on other algorithms. And I, I have no, I'm, I'm not sure whether the evolutionary algorithms will be what will get there first. No, but what I mean, I mean, uh, Dan, your definition of free will, uh, you must agree that it, that could appear also in an artificial general intelligence, I guess. And then we have no idea of of what kind of decisions this free will w might yes, make. Yes, it could. I, I, I agree completely with Nick that this is a, a, a practical, po a, a, a theoretical possibility. Yeah. But I think that um, I would certainly put my bet way down the decades because I think that there's still, with all the wonderful uh, deep learning systems, and they're all in a certain sense, as I say, Darwin-esque, because they're, they're all competence without comprehension. Uh, and they're, they're absolutely brilliant as sort of smart fabrics from which to build a mind. But, but we haven't yet, as far as I can tell, nobody is yet really working hard on what comes after that to put together not just face recognition, but the ability to use vision the way we use vision. Uh, that's still a long way off. It's a little bit like, well, we've got the retina now, and we've got, we've got, we've got, uh, uh, we've got some of V1, but, but that's just the beginning of vision in the brain. But even if it's 300 years away, shouldn't we start to plan well, for it? Yes, well, I mean, that, uh, but, uh, yes, except I, when, when Nick was uh, uh, talking about planning for what happens when it, when it happens and how we should prepare for it, um, he didn't have anything right here to say about what I think is almost certainly going to be the intervening step, which is when we have subhuman intelligent systems. That is, they're not going to be super intelligent yet. They're going to be significantly less than human intelligence, but a lot more than they are today. Do you agree with that? And this? those systems mm. are going to raise all kinds of difficulties for us. They're not going to be super intelligent. They're not going to solve the world's problems. They're not going to win, the, you know, <laughs> win all the Nobel Prizes. Uh, but they are going to be extraordinarily disruptive. And I think we should be more worried about yeah. the... Stupid machines. About people overrating stupid machines. Mm -hmm. They're not stupid, but they're not going to be... They're going to be tools, not colleagues. And actually, we want to keep it that way. Do you agree with this, Nick? Well, there are several things in there. So maybe we could first figure out whether we actually do disagree on the timelines um, by trying to put some. So what would your 50% mark be? Like, by which year do no, you think? I, 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 don't, I don't think that, to, uh, well, that I would put it, uh, I'd say never, for, for a very simple reason. Um, why would anybody want to pay for this? To do it, and really do it, would dwarf every technological project that has ever been on the planet by maybe a hundred orders of magnitude. Why do it when we can use intelligent tools that we can control? Why go out of our way to make an artificial general intelligence which could be the control system for an agent that we can't control. Because the main reason, I think, is, is that there are um, benefits along the way um, to making improvements on these kinds of algorithms. And we already find the current breakthroughs in reinforcement learning and deep learning being immediately put to commercial use. 
Um, so Facebook can sort pictures based yeah. on who's in them. You have the recent developments in reinforcement learning being used to optimize data centers. And, and in fact, huge resources are now being poured into doing this kind of AI research. And in fact, even a lot of the basic research has now migrated away from academia and into uh, the large tech companies. Yeah, I know that. Um, and, and I think all that is fine. And I think it's going to, we're going to reap many benefits from that. But I don't see why you think it's likely, let alone inevitable, that they're going to continue to uh, pour the R&D into making uh, minds rather than tools. So the question of whether what you get in the end is a tool or an agent is, is, is one where there is some uncertainty and some different views. Um, either way, you could get something that is very powerful. Okay. And it might be that in order to get an agent instead of an, in order to get a tool instead of an agent, you, you might have to, in fact, solve this control problem. Um, there is a general case for creating systems that you can give an objective and they figure out how to progressively improve their ability to reach that objective. It's a very general kind of architecture. And, and if we look at current systems, a lot of them, not all of them, but many of them have this, this feature. There are artificial agents. Um, the uh, success is obtained um, recently, say, in creating an out-of-the-box agent that can learn to play all these different Atari games and now run in three-dimensional environments. And the system that optimized this data center and that are being deployed for many other purposes, they are agents and they have an objective. Um, and they explore the environment and develop better <laughs> policies. So it's a, it's a kind of, a in my view, a fairly natural attractor. Uh, yeah. Even if you most people don't specifically aim at that. You're building up the prerequisite for building these agents by developing better tool AI systems. All you need if you have sufficiently good tool AIs is to sort of put a little reinforcement loop on top of them, which is trivial, and then you have an agent. Most of the cognitive work is done by these sort of tool modules, but you still yeah. hook it up in the right way, and you have something that tries to maximize an objective. Um, but uh, to clarify, it's not really a part of my position, certainly not a central part, that AI is about to happen much sooner than anybody expects or on any particular time scale. I'm, I'm, as I suggested in my opening remarks, fairly agnostic, although I think that progress has been faster over the last few years since the book came out than people had expected. Um, but that there is enough uh, probability that we should assign, and in fact most experts seem to actually assign, to scenarios in which this happened over some number of decades that, uh, that that should motivate a serious effort to try to figure out in advance scalable control methods. You, yeah, Nick, I think that's right. Nick, Nick you, have a, you have a colleague in your research field, Yudkovsky. He wrote an article recently called There is no fire alarm for artificial general intelligence, where he argues that there will be no warning, no way to tell in advance when it's, when it's about to happen. Do you agree with that? Did it happen it, like it, that? It, it's, it's a matter of degree, again. Like, I, I think there, it's fairly plausible that it will take many people by surprise when it finally happens. Um, and I think one, one of the points it makes is that we kind of reassess what we think of as impressive when we see machines do it. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that chess was regarded as an epitome of human intellection, these genius grandmasters with deep strategy and psychological insight. Mm -hmm. Then a chess computer can do it. We think, oh, chess is just com calculation. It's kind of nothing. Um, and uh, recently, Go is kind of maybe yeah. gone. Um, and um, it might be that you don't really get anything all that impressive until you have all the pieces there. And, but at that point, uh, it might not be that it sits there on the shelf for 10, 20 years while people, <laughs> while it sort of gradually go from village idiot to sort of slightly incompetent human to average dude on the street to... Uh, I, 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 I don't think that AI train uh, stops at Humanville Station. I think it's more likely just to swoosh right by or even accelerate. Because it's much faster than human evolution, obviously. I mean, a, a, a computer mm. intelligence could, could learn millions of times faster than we can, right? Well, so it we, could we know that the, the basic 
limitations to information processing in machine substrate are, are far beyond us in biology. That fundamental limit, like our thinking has to fit inside a cranium. Uh, and it has to use neurons that fire at 100 hertz, and signals can only travel at 100 meters per second. So we, we, we know that as you push towards technological limits, a, a computer, <laughs> you, you could have transistor speeds of gigahertz. We already have that. You can have signals going at the speed of light. You can have them being the size of a warehouse or a planet. Uh, so ultimately, from a purely computational point of view, we know that there are many, many orders of magnitude above us. Um, but, we, but we actually don't know if human level intelligence can be modeled faster in silico or in any uh, digital uh, computational device than it actually is, happens in the brain. I have, a, I have a little thought experiment on this in my book uh, where I imagine alien scientists from somewhere in the galaxy that have been watching us through telescopes for years, and they've, they've discovered cities. And they think of cities as, well, they're, they're sort of like organisms, and they grow, and they spread, and then they retreat, and they decide they're going to model cities with their wonderful computers. And so they're setting on the project, and what they're going to do is New York a bot. And somebody says, well, you know, if you're really going to do New York a bot, you're going to have to model the brains of millions of people because you won't get, you won't get the full uh, behavior of New York about unless you model the brains of all of those individuals. Now, this suddenly makes the job of making a, a, a really plausible model of New York about uh, uh, many, many orders of magnitude more difficult than they had been anticipating. Well, I think that's pretty much the situation with regard to the brain. I think we were talking earlier about making a sort of atom-for-atom atom model of, of the brain. Or you said down to the synapse level. That's a big difference, yeah. Hmm? That's a big difference between the atom and the, the synapse. The, it is a big difference. But I'm suggesting the synapse level is probably not low enough and that you'd have to go down to the motor proteins and the other activities that go on inside the cell bodies. And then, you know, 86 billion neurons and even more astrocytes, and it turns out they're playing a role. So if, if they are playing a computational role, as some people now think, we're talking about a simulation which, no matter how miniaturized and how parallelized you get it, it may not be possible to run it any faster than the brain itself runs. You just run, you run out of, of time and space. But we don't so, know that. that. Well, we I don't mean, know that, but, uh, but I think that th that's, a, that's a, uh, uh, a bit of an antidote to the uh, extrapolations about Moore's Law and how we're getting closer and closer. Maybe we're, yeah, we're getting closer and closer. Uh, we're now at the three inch mark and then we've only got seven miles to go. So it, it, I think it's important to distinguish two different success criteria that you might have. So one is if you want to predict in detail what some particular human brain will do. Maybe you do need a very, very accurate model and maybe even then, it's impossible because of chaotic influences. Maybe a single quark could sort of yeah. set off a cascade in different directions. But uh, the more relevant success criterion, I think, for, um, for this conversation, if we're wondering about the capabilities and the impact on the world, is when you have the same um, uh, problem-solving capabilities from the system, even if maybe it solves them in a slightly different way than a particular human would do. Um, so, so there we have some evidence. We know the tasks where we have succeeded so far yep. in replicating what the human brain does, in particular, say, early sensory processing, um, where we don't need ridiculous amounts of computing power to replicate what the tiny little piece of the cortex would do, but in fact, um, perhaps somewhat less than if we assume that what the brain does is basically the bulk of the information processing in, in, is in, in uh, uh, synaptic spikes. Um, 
moreover, it looks like you can get by very well with very, very simple neurons. Uh, a lot of the successes are done. There's a small class of very simple neurons, basically, that kind of sum the inputs and mm. um, multiply by the weight. Like, very simple things like that um, seem to be doing perfectly fine. Um, and so it doesn't look at all as if you need to replicate all of these. So, so, so neural, neurons have to do all kinds of things. They have to have like mitochondria to produce energy and stuff like that. Like computer just has electricity. Like it, it, it's not. Mm. Um, the, 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 the brain has a lot of stuff in there to do certain things. Uh, but if you have a different medium of doing them, uh, you, you can kind yeah. of do away with a lot of that. That, that's um, that's uh, was the in initial enabling uh, simplification of AI, is that we didn't have to worry about energy. There was all the electricity you want, and this is this very idea has recently been challenged. And I've I've decided I'm impressed by this argument by Terry Deacon, who says this decision to isolate information from energy although it was a great simplification for getting AI up and going and for cognitive science in general, it's the wrong simplification because the architectures that you get are all deeply parasitic. They, they cannot be autonomous in the way they have to be because they, don't, they depend on getting energy from, from their keepers, in effect. And that changes the very architecture it's, it's, a, it's an argument I find very plausible, but it's, it's hardly a, a, a knockdown argument. But I think we have to take seriously the suggestion that the architectures you get when you make the energy information divorce which has been such an enabler. I've heralded it myself in a lot of publications. The, the, the uh, systems, the architectures that are possible in that world are severely limited in ways that matter. Um, do you want to reply? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the argument. So certainly energy efficiency is an important design um, the sideratum in, in making, say, chips uh, for these applications. And one of the things that has fueled these recent advances has been first the move from using CPUs to GPUs, the graphics processing units. Turns out the same chips you built for video games were quite suitable for running these parallel computations, matrix multiplications that are needed for implementing neural networks. And more recently, you have ASICs, so chips customized specifically for running these, and, and thinking about memory and uh, energy and processing trade-offs is, is kind of integral to that. Um, but I, I don't see why you would have to have the energy being produced in a little furnace inside the computer box or why, why like anything like that would make a difference. It may, I, may I ask Nick um, uh, another question? Um, uh, because you discuss in your book the, the different problems or risks that w might come once we actually create a superintelligence that is way beyond human intelligence. And one thing you mention is that if we have superintelligence, this intelligence might, for example, figure out what the objective moral values are and might come to the conclusion that the best universe with the least suffering is actually a universe without any humans at all. Uh, how, how, I mean, if, if a superintelligence comes to moral conclusions that is not to the benefit of humans, how should we react to that if we don't have any control over it? So it's, it's not kind of the main scenario to, um, to focus on. I mean, I think um, the, 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 there, there's a kind of prior problem, which is if you want to have, you, you imagine a solution to the, 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 the AI problem, like building something that's really smart. Now, how do you control it? So there's yeah. the problem there of how you get any plausible value in, wh whether it's do the more the right thing, or make me more money, or, mm. or whatever it is. And any plot, make beauty, make justice, like 
Um, and any possible human value, how, how do you get into what is ultimately a, a Python program or a C++? Like, how do you write that into code? Mm. Um, so, so then, if you solve that, yes, then there is the further problem of what values do you actually put in there, and that's kind of a political problem, and then, as well as a moral problem. But we only get the privilege to sort of struggle over that if somebody actually figures out the solution to the technical problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, and mm. I, if, to say something specifically on, on the scenario you set up, so first, I guess, it presupposes um, that there are objective, discoverable facts about uh, morality. Um, uh, and then, presumably, if there are, if, if you have a general AI that's efficiently smart, it can figure them out probably better than we can. That, it doesn't follow then that it is motivated by mm. those values that it has discovered. There are a lot of humans who understand what's right and wrong and yet choose the wrong. So um, it's not enough to have an AI that understands either what's morally right or what we want. You also have to engineer its motivation system such that it will actually pursue those values. Um, and if nevertheless you take the case where there is objective ethics, the AI figures out what it is, and it's designed in such a way that it is optimized to try to maximize the probability of doing the moral or the right thing, or exactly how you phrase that. Uh, then, then you might get something that we wouldn't like at all. Yeah. Uh, and which, which is one reason for I, I, I think I would not propose to do that, but to do something <laughs> different. If you can decide. Yeah. I mean. So that, that maybe would be my input to the second question. If we figure out the technical question, now we have a big debate about what we should do with it. And I think maybe do the more or the right thing would probably not be my recommendation. But okay, but let me ask you, <laughs> if we take the discussion a little bit more down to earth and, and discuss what, what is quite close, like for example, self-driving cars. Uh, that already exists and it probably can develop quite quickly to be much better. Um, what kind of mo ethical codes should we program into a self-driving car, for example? I mean, if you are a utilitaria utilitarian, uh, you would say that it's better to kill one person than five persons, for example. Imagine that this car comes into a situation where it has to choose between driving over a whole family on the street or crash into a wall and kill the passenger. Then the car decides to crash into the wall, but no one will travel with a car with that kind of ethics program, right? <laughs> so what kind of ethics should we program into it? So, so I, I'm actually maybe you're, not maybe very... Maybe you're uh, undervaluing <laughs> your fellow human beings. Maybe a lot of us would get into that car. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's an open question. If the risk was so? uh, being responsible for the death of five, maybe we'd take our chances. Oh, but I mean, this is a serious problem. We have to decide what kind of ethics no, we should... No, I don't no? think it's a serious problem. Why? No, I, no, I think self-driving cars is, is, is an engineering problem, first and foremost. What you want is a car that doesn't crash, and that, that's where the focus should be. Sure, but... Uh, but things... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, but things can happen. The car doesn't control the environment. I mean... The, the car can control its own driving, but not other cars, for example, that might make yes. errors. So it might have to choose in a certain situation between two bads, right? It, the it's the like engineers are you, worrying about these you're very You're sort of issues implicitly now. choosing when, when you design vehicles um, between different design criteria, like how fast does it go, uh, how much money do you spend in putting lights and warning things on it? You could make cars safer by having sort of orange lights flashing all the time and big cushions on the front and back. So if the idea is that engineers and, and firms making products implicitly make some moral judgments, I think that's true, but that's not new. Um, and I think maybe there are other domains where, where the moral issues arising will, will you know, be, be more controversial or be more interesting. For or, example? Well, so I think Facebook is facing a lot of these now, where, mm -hmm. uh, and, and to some extent Google, where, where, where people have, some people have view that certain information should not be disseminated because it whatever helps ter terrorists or it spreads pedophilia or whatever, and other, 
Once you start getting into that game, however, you, you then suddenly find yourself as being the arbiter um, of, of what is legitimate and what is not, which is not an enviable position if you're a company because there's going to be huge disagreement and whatever you do, you're going to have sort of half the people hating you. But certainly there is that, that kind of deeply like ethically fraught terrain. Um, and I, I think at the more impactful question, the way we humans decide as a society is to make trade-offs between, say, transparency and privacy, uh, surveillance, security, how we architect our information systems it could be a very important thing that, again, touches on important ethical questions. Another thing that is quite interesting is, of course, how humans react to robots emotionally. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but for example, many of you have probably seen this film on YouTube with this big dog, this uh, robot who learns to walk with four legs and it learns to climb upstairs and it learns to walk in the woods and, and then this robot goes out on, on, a I on ice and it seems to almost fall because it looks like it cannot really... But then it learns to stabilize itself. And then a man comes and kicks the robot very hard, so it falls. And the interesting thing is that when you see this, you feel that was not nice to do. That's your emotional reaction, <laughs> even though it's just a robot. Um, do you think this will cause problems or controversies? I mean, will we have movements trying to give robots human rights and, and moral status and so on when, when, when we develop robots that act like humans. And are before that, uh, act like animals or... Yeah, yeah. Or, um, I, mean, I, I think the focus there is not so much on the robotic, like the, the sort of the body part of it, but, but more on the mind part of it. So you could have, a, in my view, a morally considerable entity even if it has no body. If, it, if it's just something that happens inside a microprocessor. Uh, and conversely, you can have very lifelike <laughs> bodies uh, that maybe even look indistinguishable from a human, but that have uh, no or, or barely perceptible moral standing, that it's more symbolic. It's like spitting on the flag or something, uh, that it kind of mm. expresses a bad attitude, perhaps, if you do that to big dog. But there is no there there uh, uh, that, that would have moral status. But, but I do think that this is w a potentially important um, source of moral concern as we move forward. Um, and, um, and one that gives one pause. If, if you think about our track record with regard to animals, uh, it's not that great. Um, but animals many of them have faces and they can squeak and, and it's easier to, for our empathy to sort of extend. Whereas if you just have a box with a green indicator light on it, like it's going to take more work for us um, to, to respond to that as, as we should. Uh. What do you say, Dan? Well, this, this raises uh, an issue that concerns me. Uh, I think Alan Turing, one of my all-time heroes, mm. actually got us off on the wrong foot in one way with the Turing test, which after all is a test in which the robot wins by f fooling you into thinking it's a human being. Mm. And this has put a premium on anthropomorphic behavior, on being as human-like as possible. And so a lot of people, hobbyists and AI people, have gone out of their way to, to try to make their AIs more human-like, more agent-like, uh, because, in effect, this is how you go to pass the Turing test. I think that, in fact, we should try to reverse that, absolutely, and we should start treating humanoid touches on AIs as false advertising, criminally false advertising. We should... We should in the United I'm not States, sure about the criminal, but the well, other part. No, I yeah. <laughs> in the United States now, it's quite. I don't know about in Sweden, but in, in the United States, when they have advertisements for pharmaceuticals on television, new drugs, they have these comically long list of of uh, side effects that are reported, and that's a matter of law. And if you don't do that, you go to jail. You are required to point out every known flaw, and if if AI companies when they introduced the system, if they had to not just tell users, but train users on all the known 
shortcomings, shallow spots, gaps, uh, uh, limits of the systems before those users would be permitted to use the systems. And then they have to be bonded, and then insurance companies would have to provide uh, uh, malpractice insurance for the users, and the insurance companies would put tremendous pressure on the builders of these systems, the makers of these systems, to make them completely transparent so that th they would minimize the risk of over-endowing these things with a comprehension that they didn't have. This would be a move which would, would uh, potentially nip in the bud this thirst for ever more human-like AIs. The one problem I see with it is that I foresee one of the most lucrative and arguably benign uses of AIs in the near future in elder care. And there, the premium on friendliness ability to comfort, the ability to apparently have a meaningful conversation, to be a good listener, all of those uh, features are, are going to loom very large. And at the same time, if you want to make those robots right, you want to make it so they don't mind doing this job. And that means they, should be, they shouldn't be conscious and that, <laughs> so we face, we face a real problem there, I think. Do you yeah. want to comment uh, on that? I mean, I, I think, so a lot of these PR stunts, I think the most recent one was somewhere in the Middle East, somebody had built a robot that they had managed to persuade the government to give citizenship to or something like that. But it's pure PR stunts, right? So the real action is elsewhere, but I think not, not outlawed, but maybe make fun of it and stuff like that when it happens. Um, and, and there are some legitimate uses for introducing anthropomorphic elements. Uh, a lot of people like Siri to have a more natural sounding voice and to be able to speak to it rather than, I don't know, have machine code appearing on the screen or something like that. Um, so, yes, it would be good if people were more savvy, uh, but it, it's, it's a big boulder to roll up the mountain to try to educate everybody about well, how Well, let's these roll that work. boulder because that's... Be my guess. That's yes, what, yes, that's we are all where in, we, we are all in. This is, this is what I mean when I say I think the dangers are here now. We don't have to wait for superintelligence. We're going to be in deep trouble long before we get to superintelligence. Worrying about superintelligence now is a little bit like worrying about, you know, the, uh, the heat death of the universe. You know, when we've got, well, <laughs> let's deal uh, with climate change first. But well, I mean, let, let's yeah. think about that. So the heat death of the universe, <laughs> depending on exactly when you sort of count the death to have happened, um, would be 10 billion years or much more, depending on whether you need yeah. sort of solar sized. So that, 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 and it's known that that's the duration. Yeah. And it's not clear that there's really anything we can do about it anyway. Um, so with AI, on the other hand, we have the median uh, expert opinion thinking it will uh, more likely than not happen um, in our lifetime for at least a lot of the younger people in the audience. Um, and we would be the ones building it, and there is a very concrete thing we can do, which is to uh, figure out scalable control methods in advance, and maybe as we move closer, there may be things in, in the governance space and so forth. Um, so they seem very different. Yes, but in the meantime, we're going to have problems that we know are hitting us now. Of and course, next there year, is many the problems in the world. And but so, shouldn't we be devoting more time and energy to figuring out? how to deal with the problems that are just around the corner. But still then, still then, your colleague Sam Harris says that even if it's 300 years away, we have a superintelligence. He gives this example in a TED talk saying that, imagine we pack, pick up a signal from outer space, from intelligent life. We decode it and it says, we're coming to you in 300 years. Shouldn't we start to plan for that now? Yes, we should, of course. Sure. Yeah, so I think that's your, your point a little bit, Nick. So Even not, it's not a, it's at the expense of planning it, it, for the things that are going to happen during the next 200 yeah, yeah, years. So, so yeah. I mean, one can try to think a little bit systematically about these kinds of 
question. And mm. I mean, in fact, I think the, the effective altruist mm. folk, there are like some here and maybe... Yeah, there yeah, are yeah. So, and we, we actually share office space with uh, the, um, some, some of these mm. EA organizations. So, so the basic thought is there, is that in addition to want to make some personal sacrifice for the good of the world, and a lot of people have at least some desire to improve the world, you should combine that with some reflective effort to think where, where your dollars or your volunteer hours will actually do the most harm. Uh, oh, good, sorry. Uh, <laughs> My evil side just sits down. <laughs> Naked um, Dan, we, we, sorry, yeah. So, um, so you start with a limited domain. Say you want to help poor people in Africa. So should you dig wells or hand out ma uh, mosquito nets or, or vitamin pills? Uh, and, then, then you can, and, and it turns out that there are orders of magnitude difference in the uh, number of lives you will save with a certain number of dollars depending on which charity you give to. So it's more important to pick the right charity than to give twice as much, or even 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. um, but then you can take this to the next level and you think, well, helping poor people in Africa is one cause you could work on. A another cause is global warming. Um, another cause is trying to prevent new wars. Uh, and another is to try to improve political systems so that they are more just and equitable. Uh, a third might be preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And, and so there are many, many different possible cost areas. So how, how do you make some judgment as to which of these yeah. um, you could have the, the greatest bang for your buck? And that then requires some fairly difficult judgments involving macro strategy, how different the things affect other things. But the, broadly speaking, the, the greater the stakes, the greater the probability that you will make a difference. Um, you know, the more plausible a candidate it is for something to focus on. Um, and by those criteria, it looks like working on this AI control might be a plausible candidate. The stakes really could be the entire future of earth oriented intelligent life, which if things go well, or even if things don't go well, might spread through the observable universe, which as far as we can see looks empty. So you have 10 to the power of 20 something solar systems out there. Um, that's um, and now, in terms of your ability to make a difference, it, it, it's, it's going to be quite small. Uh, but nevertheless, at least until a couple of years ago, specifically trying to make progress on the AI alignment problem, there were maybe less than a dozen people worldwide. Um, and, and now there are more. But still, it's, it's a very, very tiny fraction of, of the world's research effort or the world's that, that is going into this. If, is you might be able to increase that by 1%, let's say, by just sort of devoting some serious effort to that. So if, I, I think, obviously, the more, more detail it would have to be filled in, but if you sort of just run, do the sums, as it were, um, you will get a prima facie case for this being hugely impactful in expectation. Um, and, and a lot more so, I think, than working on the heat death problem. <laughs> My friends, oh, I agree with that. this time flies and we actually have to end here. It was fantastic to hear you talk about this. And I, I, I just, it reminds me of the most famous AI ever from the world of films is probably Hal from the film 2001. And there's a famous quote from Hal when he says, I am putting myself to the fullest possible use, which is all I think that any conscious entity can ever hope to do. That's a good way to conclude. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming. You will have flowers. Yeah. And yeah. thank you so much. Yeah.